Welcome to the lecture for Research Methods. We'll be talking today about surveys and samples. So an overview in terms of surveys, we'll talk about interviews and questionnaires, a few tips about creating good questionnaires, and then in terms of uh, samples, two different types we'll focus on, probability and non-probability samples. Okay, surveys. Uh, two types, interviews and questionnaires. Interviews can be uh, unstructured or structured. If you have an unstructured interview, obviously, you uh, generally have some topic you want to cover. You're, you're interviewing something about somebody about something, but you don't have particular questions written down that you're going to ask everybody the same questions. What you ask them is going to depend on what they're saying, right? So you may start with an initial question, tell me about your experiences working in a coal mine, right? But then depending on what their answer is, your follow-up is going to be different from person to person. And that's great in terms of um, flexibility. Um, but for a, a structured interview, you have precise questions you, you're looking for. Uh, and there's some that are used clinically, like the, the SCID and the SCID2, the Structured Clinical Interview for Diagnosis, where you have certain questions that you're asking to uh, and then no matter who you talk to, these are the questions you ask. Here's the order you're going to ask them in. Um, but even that, uh, even though it's structured, uh, the skid, for example, has some uh, logic built in say, where if they say yes or no to certain questions, it cues you to ask different questions. And ultimately, those are designed to get to a particular um, diagnosis, determine if somebody meets criteria for a, a diagnostic category. Um, so as you can probably imagine, when choosing between an unstructured or structured interview, the unstructured is going to give you uh, lots of rich information. The structured will give you maybe less information, maybe some things you didn't think to ask about or you wanted to ask, but well, it wasn't on my question list, couldn't ask it. But you also have some more guidelines. So one of the differences we see uh, in these two types of interviews is the amount of training needed for the interviewer. Obviously for a structured interview, you don't need a lot of specialized training. For an unstructured one, yeah, you do. You need somebody that knows how to ask questions in a way that won't be leading, uh, where it won't be clear what your bias is. And also, if you're doing an interview um, about sensitive subjects, you need somebody trained in asking, asking questions sensitively and somebody that can deal with the emotional fallout. If you ask people about their trauma experiences, for example, right, you probably want someone with some clinical training uh, that will, can kind of recognize the cues of agitation or somebody's dissociating and will know what to do to um, stop aggravating that person, stop causing them distress and bring them back down, bring them back in the room, right? So for unstructured interviews, typically you need more training. And the other, one of the other big differences in terms of your ability to make comparisons across respondents. It's possible but difficult to make comparisons across respondents uh, if you use an unstructured interview because again you're going to be asking them different things and so it may not be uh, that easy it may not be that fair to compare what one person said to what somebody else said oh well they didn't mention this at all well you didn't ask about that right whereas with the structured interview if you ask them all the same things okay well now i can say okay when i told you to list your biggest fear these people said this these people said this right one particular type of interview that uh, is often useful is the use of focus groups. Right? This is where you're interviewing um, a large group of people, not large people, but a group of people uh, at one point in time. And really they're not that large. Usually uh, kind of like a group therapy group, about eight people, plus or minus four. And there's a couple different ways to do it. One would be to find members with some shared characteristic or shared experience, right? Where you're interested in um, learning more about the, the experience of first year kindergarten teachers then you're going to go recruit a bunch of first year kindergarten teachers and have them talk in this group about those experiences. And one of the nice things about doing it in a group rather than just with uh, um, one person at a time is, let's say you ask a question about, uh, you know, what's been frustrating? And then if you ask people individually, okay, they're going to say whatever they're going to say. Oh, this or this, this. And there may not be much overlap. But if they're in a group and one person says, oh, this, other people in the room, they may not have said that answer if you asked them one-on-one because -on -one, they wouldn't have thought of it. But they go, oh, yeah, I didn't even think about that. That is really frustrating. Let me tell you about that when it happened to me. 
So uh, with a focus group, especially when there's this shared experience, shared characteristic, um, you can get more um, more data on kind of these commonalities because the participants are sharing information with each other. Which obviously the downside of that is what one person says may influence what another person says. Right? There's some some group dynamics that may go on where somebody may say, "Yeah, me too." when they don't really have that experience, but they uh, don't want to seem weird or uh, go against the grain, right? There's some conformity pressures there, possibly. Um, another thing that's nice about focus groups, in addition to getting the content of what they tell you, you can also observe the process of what happens. Okay, so everybody in the room was chill and they were all happy. And then when we got to this topic, it was noticeable that people became agitated. Their voices became raised. They uh, were no longer leaning back in the chairs. They were sitting forward, uh, hands clasped. Right? There's all this other process information you can get in addition to um, the content that you may not be able to get otherwise. So again, you may do it with people that are kind of the same in some way, or you might uh, do a focus group with a diverse group. So in this case, you're not so much interested about the experiences of these, uh, these people. Oh, it's something about them that's all the same. It may be about, okay, there's a, a new proposal to um, you know, raise taxes um, for the school, and we want to know how people feel about it. Well, if you want to know how people feel about it, you probably don't want to get all teachers or all parents or all people who don't have kids. You want people uh, have different uh, experiences, different vested interests in that to figure out, okay, what are the commonalities among diverse uh, members of diverse groups in terms of their concerns about this uh, proposal, whatever it is. So a couple different ways to do focus groups, but they can be good. Um, but interviews in general, great for qualitative research, um, but they can be uh, expensive. They can be uh, time consuming, a little bit difficult to, to do, right? Because obviously you're doing it uh, largely face to face. You can do it over the phone some. I'd say that's becoming increasingly difficult um, as uh, Fewer people have home phones and people um, often, uh, we'll see what happens genera generationally, but for uh, I think a current ch big chunk of people, the cell phone is you know off limits for um, interview uh, surveys and businesses. This is my personal number. In my home phone, maybe you'll call that, which is a, a weird thing. That may be changing. We'll see. Um, so an alternative to interviews to get uh, information would be questionnaires, right? So either... Um, where your uh, respondents are uh, individually uh, writing down their responses. So obviously uh, much cheaper than interviews, um, easier to make them anonymous, right? You can't do an interview, um, at least a face-to-face -face interview, anonymously. You might be able to do a phone interview fairly anonymously. Like if they call into you, uh, you don't know who they are, assuming you can't recognize their voice. Um, but if people are submitting written things, it's much easier to assure uh, anonymity. But one of the big concerns about questionnaires, because of that anonymity, because you're not in, in the room with them, you don't know if they're going to answer, right? So there's a concern about uh, the response rate, right? If you send out your survey, and let's say you mail it to people, and you mail it to 100 people, if you get 30 of them to mail it back, well, that's pretty good. That's not too bad a response rate. Again, depending on what group you're you're trying to get data from and how relevant the questions are to them. Like if they really want to tell you about their experiences, you're going to get a higher response rate. Right? If they think, oh yeah, people need to know about what happened to me or what I feel about this, obviously you'll get more responses. If it's not, if it's more just stuff that you're interested in or that's scientifically interesting, but it's not intrinsically interesting to them, you're going to have a harder time getting a, a sufficient response rate. And that can be problematic. So obviously, uh, questionnaires traditionally were done uh, paper and pencil. You know, you'd mail them, or maybe you'd hand them out to people, kind of like flyers in the uh, on the street. Uh, but more and more, there's a move to um, online distribution of questionnaires, which makes it uh, even cheaper to distribute it and uh, easier to distribute these uh, questionnaires to a larger group than you could do with paper and pencil measures. Okay. When um, constructing a survey, in particular questionnaires, and this relates to interviews to some degree. With interviews, 
a, a bad question you can kind of deal with because participants can, if it's unclear what you're asking, they can ask about it and they can just back and forth to clarify. But if you're writing it down, they're just reading it and you're not there to explain, you have to really pay attention to how you're writing questions to get uh, accurate, valid responses. So here's some, some types of bad questions to ask. Double-barreled questions. So this is when you're asking two questions at once, right? An example would be, uh, you know, to what extent do you feel that spanking is appropriate and the timeout is ineffective? Well, that's two things, right? And from your perspective, you might think, oh, these are the same thing. People who feel spanking is okay are going to think that because they think timeout doesn't work. So they'll be like, yeah, I totally think spanking is good and timeout's bad. Or they'll be on the opposite side, oh, no, spanking is not appropriate, but timeout's good. But that's not necessarily true. People might think, oh, I think spanking is appropriate. Oh, but timeout is, is effective as well. But if you put two questions at once, and now I've given them um, some response where it's, you know, completely agree to completely disagree, and they're marking somewhere in there, and they are answering the two parts of this question differently, they don't know how to answer them. So they may put neutral. I'm like, oh, okay, wow, they're neutral? That, that's weird. Well, they're not neutral. They just couldn't find, there wasn't a way for them to appropriately, appropriately answer the question. So ask one question at a time. Stay away from loaded questions, right? Loaded questions are ones that uh, contain an assumption about the person answering the question, right? Oh, so yeah, uh, knowing that you feel this way, knowing that this is true, how about this, right? So if you said, what things that your professor does make you the most angry? So this is assuming that the professor does something or some things that make them angry. Well, which one is, which, what's the worst? If nothing my professor does makes me angry, they're so great like Dr. Fiala, gosh, how do I answer this question, right? So making this kind of uh, presupposition built into the question um, is inappropriate. It, it uh, keeps some people from being able to answer the question. Similar to that is a leading question, right? And this is a question where the wording kind of tells the person what the right or expected answer is. Right. This is where you're using kind of uh, usually emotional language or some sort of strong language. You know, so are you opposed to the slaughtering, uh, to to slaughtering innocent animals for research that has no immediate application? Yeah, I, I guess so. Right. So if you word it that way, you may get one response from a person. That same person may answer differently if you say, uh, "Would you support the use of uh, uh, animals in research?" that may ultimately lead to breakthroughs in science that can save lives if that animal uh, is ultimately euthanized. Okay, well, that's the same question asked a little bit differently, right? So you wanna ask questions as neutrally as possible, but you're not leading them, leading them down to, yeah, you should agree with this, you should disagree with this, right? Which kind of often ties into uh, social desirability and self-presentation uh, needs. You also want to be careful about your use of absolutes, always, never, everyone, no one. Right? So how true is it that you always help a friend in need? Okay, and now you're going to have me say if it's, you know, always true, sometimes true, or never true, right? Because we usually have absolutes in our uh, our anchors. So if it is it sometimes true that I always help someone? What does that even mean? Right? I sometimes always, or I always always, or I never always. If I never always, is that sometimes? It's very confusing, right? So stay away from absolutes in the question, because typically you're going to have absolutes, um, or not typically, but often you have absolutes in your anchors, so keep them out of your questions. Be mindful of your vocabulary level and the use of jargon, right? Um, and depending on who you're survey, surveying, if it's a general population, you probably want the vocabulary level like at a fifth grade level. Right? Because you, and not that the general population is generally at a fifth grade reading level, but at a fifth grade reading level, they don't have to be paying quite as close attention to answer accurately. If we get up to high school or especially a college level, reading level for a survey, they may have to read the question several times. What, oh, what? Oh, I, I see what you're saying now, right? It'll, it'll take them longer and they have to exert more effort, which means they're less likely to complete the survey. We want to make it uh, as easy on participants as possible to answer our questions so that they will answer all our questions so we can get good data. 
we want to say from stay away from jargon kind of professional language lingo that oh yeah i know what that means everybody knows what that means well not everybody who's in your field maybe knows what that means right so things like uh, in terms of vocabulary level if you ask you know to what extent do you have disagreements with your spouse regarding pecuniary obligations pecuniary what i never i guess because i don't know what that word means right uh in terms of jargon uh, do you rely on reaction formation to do a threat to your ego? Reaction what? Right? No, if you're a, a psych major and you, oh, yeah, I know Freud, reaction formation, got it, defense mechanisms, sure, I can answer that question. If you don't have that somewhat specialized knowledge, it's not going to make sense to you. So say it in, as they say, plain English, as if you were uh, explaining it to a fifth grader, what words would you use? Uh, be careful of uh, double negatives again especially with kind of liquor type items where I'm gonna be saying uh, you know uh, agree or disagree or uh, you know true or not true somewhat not at all because if I have double negatives I have things like okay how true is it that you aren't able to not talk to your ex and if I say yes it's very true maybe I get that if I go no it's not true so no it's not true that I'm not able to not talk to my what? Because when you have a double negative and your response is also going to be either affirmative or negative, if it's a negative, now I've got a triple negative. I've got to work through, okay, what, is, what am I saying when I answer that? And again, we want to make it as easy as, place as little cognitive demand as possible on participants completing surveys, questionnaires, in order that they're most likely to answer all the questions. Because what we really care about is getting that accurate information. And if we're confusing them with our words, uh, they're more likely to either quit or just go, I don't, I don't know, four, two, three, whatever. I'll put a number. I don't care. Right? They may get uh, you know, emotionally upset at the questionnaire. Other things to look out for, uh, if your answers, uh, so not the questions themselves, but the, the possible answers, the anchors, uh, if they overlap, that can be confusing. Right, so how large is your friend group? You know, zero to two, two to four, four to six, six to eight. I don't look too bad. Uh, I've got six friends, so do I put four to six or six to eight? Ah, right. So you want disjunctive categories, things that don't overlap. If you're going to uh, uh, do these kind of categorical answers. Um, on the flip side, uh, answers might not be exhaustive. Right, so. Oh, is it A or B? Well, it's C, but you didn't put my thing, right? So you put, and this is kind of a, a newer one for a lot of researchers, what is your gender? And you give two options, male or female. For somebody who's transgender or identifies in some other way, doesn't fit into this kind of binary system, they don't know how to answer that question, and they may ultimately leave it blank, which again is going to be uh, an empty cell in your data set. So give them somewhere to to put an answer and and if you think well i can't think of every possible uh gender category or if we're talking about like ethnicity every possible ethnic identity or combination of ethnic identities for people who are, are multi-ethnic or multi-racial you know put ones that are kind of standard and what standard is often what's on the u.s census and then add an other and gives people space to fill in what that other is so they can feel like they have a place to express identity and be represented represented and also you can get the data about who's actually in your sample because if you don't then you go oh, there i don't know maybe they missed it maybe they didn't read that question maybe they skipped it you don't know because you didn't give them a space to answer uh questions that are just vague right and this often happens um whenever we're kind of in our own heads about our questions and we don't run it by somebody else so it's always a good idea to run your questionnaire your survey by a friend do a pilot test uh, an example would be uh when was the last time you were disappointed in the outcome of a relationship right. and you may think well i am interested in uh romantic relationships so that, that's what i'm asking about well you didn't say that what if i read that i go okay well i had a friend once who um, really upset me and uh, we stopped talking right but that's not what you wanted to know what you wanted to know is about romantic relationships but i talked about a friend or about a family member or about a coworker. Right, so be precise with what you're asking for. Don't leave it. Uh, don't leave too much room for interpretation, right? Because then you'll be upset that they didn't uh, answer in a way that fits into the question you meant to ask. Ask what you mean to ask. 
And as I've already kind of said, uh, if you don't give an option to, to not answer or, or say other, right? So if you say, well, you know, what's your religious affiliation? Pick one of these categories. And if somebody is not religious at all and you didn't give the, a space for them to say that, they're like, well, psh, screw this guy. He didn't even give me a place to answer that. I'm not going to finish this survey. He's making assumptions about me or she's making assumptions about me. Right? So give people an out, uh, especially on questions that uh, may be sensitive or may be tied to identity. Right? Uh, and again, questions that make assumptions about people that you need to have an, uh, an option of, you know, it doesn't apply to me. Like if you say, you know, what, uh, what uh, substances of abuse have you uh, used in the past? Right? If somebody hasn't used any substances of abuse, they need to have the option to say that, right? Because if they just leave it blank, blank doesn't mean none. Blank means they didn't answer it. You can't assume what, a, uh, what an empty cell means. So give people a place to answer. Okay, a few other just general tips about questionnaire construction. Keep it short, keep it short. Again, getting people to start a survey, tough. Getting them to finish it, also tough. So don't uh, don't add questions you don't really want the answer to. Get it down to a bare minimum. And however short it is, make it look shorter, right? And this can be in terms of uh, breaking up the pages. We don't want to have just one long, if you know, like an online uh, questionnaire, you don't want a thing where, you know, they can scroll down and go, holy moly, it's a hundred questions. This is forever. I'm not doing that. Break it up where they only see a little bit at once so it doesn't feel so overwhelming. Um, there's some just kind of formatting tricks you can do to fit more questions on a page uh, if possible. It's also helpful, um, particularly if you have a, a fairly short survey, to use a, a progress tracker where they can see that kind of little bar. Okay, I'm almost done. Uh, I'm, I'm going to keep going, right? I'm gonna, if you have a really long survey, you may not want a progress tracker because, geez, I'm going to be here forever. But if it's a reasonable reasonable length survey, let them know. That way, if they're you know 75% done and they know that, they're more likely to finish. If they're 75% 75 done, like, I don't know how long this is going to be. I got to go. I can't finish this. Oh, there's only four more questions. Well, they didn't know that, right? So let them know if you, again, follow the advice of keeping it short. Let them know how short by having some sort of progress tracker built in. Uh, use skip logic to make it shorter for some people, right? So um, and this is especially easy to do in an online service, but you can do it paper ones too, right? Where you have little arrows. We ask a question, you know, and if yes, proceed to the next one. If no, skip down to number 12, right? And you have a little arrow that takes it down to number 12. Things like, uh, are, are you currently uh, uh, a service member or prior service, right? And if, if yes, maybe it'll take them to, okay, what branch? If no, it'll take them to the next question. It's not gonna ask them, oh, okay, uh, you're, you're not military? Okay, what branch of service? Uh, are you still in? Uh, how many years have you been out? Right, no point for those people that, that doesn't apply to asking them those questions. And for an, an online server, you can build it in where they don't even see those questions, where it'll skip to where you need them to go. Again, you can do it paper uh, as well, but super easy to do with um, online questionnaires. It makes surveys uh, shorter for some participants. The questions you really need answered, you tend to want to put those toward the beginning just in case somebody doesn't get all the way down and finish everything. There's some questions, well, yeah, I want to ask this, but that's not my main hypothesis. My main hypothesis about these two variables, well, put those near the beginning. With a caveat being, you want a logical flow to your survey, right? Um, you don't want to, it can be disruptive if you're asking about, okay, uh, tell me about your TV viewing habits. Okay, now tell me um, about how much fruit you're eating. What, what does that have to do anything? It can be kind of jarring and it gives people pause and it may then take them longer. So a logical flow as much as possible, but within that logical flow, again, the questions you really want answered near the beginning, questions that may be off-putting, like uh, how much do you earn? Um, or uh, if you're gonna ask um, things that are make people uncomfortable, put those near the end, right? Because if they're near the end, okay, especially I'm using that progress tracker, I'm 75% done, I don't really wanna answer this, but I'm almost done, screw it, I'm gonna answer it. Whereas if that's the beginning, I don't, I don't like thinking about this. This makes me uncomfortable. I haven't answered anything. I'm not, I'm not invested in my time. It's easier for me to 
close it out, tear up the paper, whatever it is, and be done. So those kind of more challenging questions, try to put those toward the end. And be sensitive um, when asking demographic questions, right? Be culturally sensitive. When you ask people to identify themselves, you're, you're asking them to share their identity with you. And however you feel about your own identity, this is me, they feel just as strongly about their identity. Maybe more so, especially if their identity is related to any kind of group that has uh, historically or currently experienced uh, oppression. And so if you ask those questions in a way that's not sensitive to that context, um, you're likely to upset people and they're less likely to answer your questions and you're not going to get the data you want. So just in addition to it being the right thing to do to be sensitive to, to these issues, it's also a matter of getting good data. You want to ask questions in such ways that you're not going to piss people off to where they're going to not do your survey, right? And it can be hard. It can be tricky because what the appropriate descriptors are for identity change across time culturally as we kind of learn new things and even as they change they're different for different people partly because when they change there's some some cohort effects where okay this group here well that's the term i use to describe myself people who are probably in the same group are now using a different term to describe themselves that are you know younger than me but i don't, I don't i'm not i don't like that term so you have to kind of be sensitive to that too it can be tricky but again do your best to, to be sensitive to those issues uh, a few more uh, tips. Uh, reversing items is, is a good idea. So here we talked before, whenever you're measuring um, any particular construct, a conceptual variable, you don't typically want to ask just one question. You want multiple questions. And you want to reverse word, reverse some of those questions so that, you know, so if I'm asking about uh, how much do you study, I don't want every question I asked where whenever you put you know, a higher number, you know, totally agree that that means I study a lot. Why do I want to do that? Well, because if somebody has a response set where they're just putting all fives or all ones, okay, then they're going to look like either they study a whole lot or it look like they study none at all. And I won't know if they were just randomly responding or if they really do study a whole lot. Now, if I reverse word items on a scale, you know, in three of the items, putting a five means I study a lot, but on three other items, putting a five means I don't study at all. If you put all fives, okay, now I've got um, a possibly valid reason to discard your data. Okay, uh, it's evident that this participant responded uh, randomly because they answered inconsistently to these opposing items or reverse worded items, so their data were eliminated from further analysis. And so you're getting rid of some of that error variance. You can tell they didn't take it seriously, and you can take them out. If you can't take them out, they're going to eat up your power. They're eating up degrees of freedom, making it harder to find what you're looking for. So uh, reversing items it can be good to kind of detect that and also to kind of keep people paying attention, honestly, during your survey. Uh, whenever you do have uh, liquor items and liquor type items, I encourage you to always put the agree over on the right with higher scoring. You know, if it's one to seven, seven is completely agree, one is completely disagree. Right? And it's not so important for people answering the survey, like, oh, one, one's agree, seven's agree, doesn't matter. That's more in terms of when you go to analyze your data, right? So if you're looking at, okay, to what extent do people think that this is a good idea to, you know, build a new football stadium? And if you have, if you reverse, if you have one is agree, okay, the average response was, um, you know, 2.3 on a seven point scale. Wow, they really agreed. That's lots of agreement. What? A low score is lots of agreement? Yeah, because one meant agree. It's counterintuitive, right? Because lots of something we think of a bigger number so it just makes more sense to put the agree, the very true, over on the right with the higher number. It makes it easier to interpret your variables uh, later. In terms of your instructions, it's a good idea on questionnaires to emphasize anonymity, right? To reduce um, people's discomfort in terms of being honest and reduce social desirability. So again, no one will know your answers. Um, uh, there, no identifying information will be gathered. And in terms of not asking identifying information, when you're asking demographics, if you ask a whole lot of specific demographics, right? So if you do a survey at this school and you ask, what's your gender, what's your age, what's your major, are you uh, military, 
do you have a disability? Okay, with all those questions together, certain patterns, I can narrow it down to about seven people maybe, right? If I know your exact age, I know your ethnicity, uh, your gender, military status, disability status, I might know exactly who that is, right? So sometimes you wanna um, ask things a little more broadly. So like age would be a good example where instead of asking, give me the number of your age, okay, are you 18 to 25, 26 to uh, 35, whatever, you come up with those uh, intervals. Right? And you can look at uh, other surveys to figure out, you know, well, what are good intervals, what are important intervals to, to look at? And typically you want those, those intervals to be the same size, okay, five year chunks, 10 year chunks, two year chunks, whatever it is, unless there's some compelling reason to do differently. Like if you're looking at a developmental study, you're looking at um, pre-adolescence, adolescence, young adulthood, middle adulthood, later adulthood, older adults, those may not be equal size intervals. But unless you're specifically looking at developmental stuff, typically equal size chunks. But doing the chunk, okay, now I can say I'm in here somewhere and you don't, it's harder for you to know who I am. And it's easier for me to feel like I'm anonymous which may make me more honest. Along those lines, encourage honesty in your instructions. You know, uh, your honest opinions are, are, are valued. It's very important for this research that you uh, are forthright, right? And share your opinions, share how you feel, right? And you can kind of have disclaimers about, there are a wide variety of opinions on this. That way you're kind of saying, there's not a right answer. It's okay to say whatever you want, right? Find some way to communicate that message that their answers are gonna be accepted, whatever they are, and you want them to be honest. Lastly, when framing your questions, consider your data analysis. And this has to do with, okay, am I gonna ask this question uh, and they're gonna put a, a one to seven scale? Am I gonna ask them to rank your greatest to least, a kind of ordinal? Am I ask open-ended where they're gonna put an answer? It's gonna be kind of qualitative because how you ask the question is gonna determine what type of data you get and what type of data you get will influence, will limit the types of analyses you can do, right? So if you wanna do um, certain things, you're gonna need certain types of data. And typically, if you're not sure, ask for things in a way that you get a number, right? A number that isn't, you know, one versus two, zero versus one, not dichotomous. More variability than that, you know, five point scale, seven point scale um, is a good default to use if you're unsure how much, uh, uh, variability you need. Uh, obviously, don't go too far. On a scale of 0 to 100, how do you feel about whatever? Because nobody's going to go, you know what? I'm really a 63. No, they're going to go somewhere close to 0, somewhere close to 100, or somewhere close to 50. And there's not going to be much in the middle, right? Because they're going to anchor and adjust. Okay, moving on to sampling. We talk about sampling. We're talking about uh, getting a group of participants from some population, right? So when we talk about uh, a population, a measure of the population, if it's the uh, average, standard deviation, mean, mode, whatever, that number, that descriptor is called a parameter, right? And these are things that are quite often unknown. S depending on what po population you're talking about, you might know it, and this is an important thing to keep in mind. When we talk about population, we're talking about a population of interest. Right? We often assume, oh, the population, that means everybody. Like everybody on Earth, I guess, or everybody in America, sure. No, typically it doesn't. Sometimes it might, but usually it's some population of interest. Okay, the population of college students in America or college students attending state universities in America. Um, professional athletes playing um, football in America. Um, and it can be really big populations. It can be uh, the students at Texas A&M University of Texas. That's my population, right? You specify what your population of interest is. And that's all about when I study a sample, I'm trying to figure out something about some larger group. Well, what's the larger group you're interested in? Are you interested in students here, students in America, students at public schools, right? And that's defined by the researcher. Okay. And again, as I was saying, sometimes you may know a parameter, especially if your population is fairly small. Like if you wanna know the 
the average age of students at AMS in Texas, right? That can be that's a known parameter. Like those data are collected, and you can you can find that out. If you want to know the the average age of uh, college students in America, I think you'd be hard pressed to get those data. Like you could maybe patch that together if you contacted contacted every university. That'd be pretty tough to do. So probably unrealistic to get that parameter. So we talk about uh, getting data from a sample. The the numbers, the values that describe a sample are statistics, right? We use statistics to make inferences, judgments about parameters that describe a population. So whenever we do that, we, when we calculate a statistic, that number doesn't per perfectly represent a parameter. Usually, we, we don't know the parameter, but we assume, yeah, if the average in the population is 100, I might get a sample, and the sample's average will be 99. And there's nothing weird about that sample. It just happened to be a little bit lower. There were a few, one or two people who were lower than average on that one brought the average down, right? Or it might be higher, right? So that difference between your sample and the population, between a statistic and a parameter, is called sampling error, right? And it's an error not in terms of, oh, you made a mistake. It's just difference from some truth, which is typically an unknowable truth. Right. Um, but the amount of sampling error you have depends on a couple things. Obviously what? It's going to depend on how big your sample is, right? If your sample is the same size as your population, you should have zero sampling error, right? As soon as it gets any smaller than that, sampling error starts to go up. If my sample is one person, I'm going to have lots of error. Right? So does it matter how big the population is? sort of up to a degree once a sample gets to a certain size right so if I have a sample of a thousand people and my population is 10,000 that's a there's gonna be not much sampling error there it should be a pretty good sample if I have a thousand people and my population is a million well is it gonna be worse not that much really there's kind of this diminishing return in terms of increasing sample size and reducing sampling error after a point right once the sample gets pretty big okay yeah that's there's not gonna be a whole lot of sampling error those sample statistics should be pretty similar to the parameters they're trying to estimate. <clears throat> okay. um, and we'll come back to how big a sample needs to be in, in just a minute. But first, let's talk about the two basic types of sampling. One is probability sampling, right? And this is where you can know the probability of someone being selected into a sample. And this is important when you are concerned about the representativeness of a sample and you're really concerned about generalizability. You know, I really want to be able to get this small group of people and make definitive statements about a larger group. Okay, well, when that's a big concern, super important to you, you probably need to use a probability uh, sampling method. Because okay. if you don't, well, you're not sure how representative it's going to be, how generalizable the findings are going to be to this larger group. But it can be fairly costly to use probability sampling, and there are some practical limitations, right? And we'll talk about what those are when we get to different types of probability sampling in just a minute. And obviously the second type would be non-probability sampling, where you don't know the odds that this person was going to be selected or not selected in your sample. They, didn't, they just, You just got them. Okay. In terms of probability sampling, random sampling, each person has an equal chance of being in the sample. Okay. So, if your population was uh, everyone living in Bell County, Bell County, Texas, right? So that's not too bad. It's not. That's not America. That's not even Texas. Just Bell County. You got uh, Temple, Belton, Glean, uh, Rogers out there in East Bell County, right? A couple of couple of towns, I would call them cities, a couple of towns, some larger, some smaller. What, uh, 200,000 people maybe in Bill County? So if you wanted to survey that population and get a sample of 100, 200 people where every person in Bell County had an equal chance of being in that sample, could you do it? You're like, well, yeah, I can get the phone book. That number is in the phone book. Okay, um, 
I would get uh, records from the county clerk's office. Uh, everybody has to register, uh, um, you know, to, to vote. Oh, you get all registered voters. Not everybody registered to vote. Uh, everybody who owns a house, eh, not everybody owns a house. Okay. Um, everybody who um, files income tax. Okay, not everybody files income tax. And it'll, you know, cash on the business. You start to think, think, okay, well, how could I do it? And ultimately, you might not be able to, right? Not everybody who lives in Bell County is a legal resident of Bell County. If you have your recruitment materials in English, not everybody in Bell County speaks or reads English. Right? Um, how many babies are you going to recruit? Okay, well, Dr. Phil, I was saying adults. Oh, okay, I know you were saying adults. You didn't say it. Yeah, adults in Bell County, that's my population. Okay, are you going to be able to get uh, participants who are in prison? Because the IRB is going to give you a hard time about that. Probably not. People who are in the hospital? No, not them. Right? So really difficult for everybody in Bell County to have an equal probability of being in your sample. Even if we try to make it even smaller. Students at Texas A&M University Central Texas. Is there a surefire way where you could reach out to every student at the university? Again, probably not. We have plenty of online students who aren't here physically. Even if you got access to email, Okay, some people are more likely to check their email than others. Well, if I never check my university email, then I've got a lower probability of being selected into your sample. So there are some uh, um, real challenges to getting a, a simple random sample in terms of uh, real world um, hurdles. The other thing to be a truly simple random sample, uh, people don't remember, you also need to use sampling with replacement. So let's say you were able to have a list of all the names in your population, which maybe if you did, okay, my population of interest is um, uh, active members of Division 22 of the American Psychological Association. Okay, you can get that. If they're an active member, they, they register uh, in this registry and they provide uh, phone number, mailing address, email. Okay, you can get those folks. So let's say you got everybody on that list. When you start drawing names, you can't reach in, draw a name, put it in a pile, and then reach in and draw another name. You need to put that first name back. Because if you pick out 10 names, okay, now when I'm reaching and draw a name, the odds of somebody still in there getting selected is greater than that first person because there's 10 less people in the pool, okay? So a truly simple random sample, um, I'd say is rarely done, rarely done. Um, you might come closer to it with stratified random sampling. This is where you identify uh, sub subgroups or strata that, okay, I need to have these people in there and then you randomly sample from those strata. So if you're interested in uh, a survey of uh, first responders, and uh, you don't want to have all firefighters or all police or all EMTs, you may then identify, okay, I'm gonna get this list of firefighters, I'm gonna randomly sample from that list, I'm gonna get this list of police officers, and I'm gonna randomly sample from that list. And together, those two, two kind of separate random samples will be my one sample. Right? So you're randomly sampling from each strata, and you can do proportionate stratified random sampling or disproportionate random stratified sampling. Proportionate would be, okay, well, if there's more police officers than firefighters, then I would select a proportionate amount of those. So if it's, you know, two to one in the population, then my sample will also be two to one. But I might also want to do disproportionate, right? Like if... Uh, um, if, especially if it's really disproportionate, if it's oh, 10 to 1, and I'm going to have 30 people in my sample, okay, well, I don't want, you know, roughly 30 people, I don't want just, you know, two or three firefighters and 27 police officers, because if I do that, how much do I really know about those firefighters? There's only three of them in my sample. So I may, maybe I want, uh, I'll do 10 of each, so it'll be a disproportionate stratified random sample. So I'll still identify the strata I want, and then I'll still randomly sample from them. Another approach that sounds, sim sounds similar but really isn't is cluster sampling. This is where you randomly select subsets or clusters of a population and then possible subsets of that on down and then ultimately randomly se select participants from within a selected cluster. Right? So you may do it um, if you're trying to do the, as your whole population is the you know adults in the, in the U.S., and then you divide up the U.S. into um, 
northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest, four quadrants. And then you randomly select one quadrant. Okay, now within that quadrant, you uh, randomly select um, three states. And within each of those three states, you randomly select three counties. Okay, well now you've got nine different counties that you're using, and then you get the list of all the people living in those counties, and you randomly select participants from those subsets of subsets. The idea being, again, if you've done it randomly, you've you've prevented some bias from creeping in sample sampling bias, and you hope that it is uh, um, representative. And again, excuse me. Probability sampling is important whenever generalizability is of ultimate importance. Having a representative sample is super important, but for a lot of our behavioral science. It's not that important, and there's other ways to kind of get at it. So we can often use non-probability sampling, right? Typically referred to as convenient sampling, a sample that's convenient. Oh, well, these people that stand outside, they want to be in a study? Cool, you're in a study, right? So you get who's available. You know, you advertise for your study. Whoever responds, yep, they're in your sample. And again, you don't know the probability of people in the population being in there. You just know these people showed up. So can that be representative? maybe how does it need to be representative like if you're wondering is it going to be representative in terms of uh, age or in terms of educational attainment or in terms of ethnicity or gender right well you can measure those characteristics in your sample add those questions to your survey to your questionnaire and then you can report back okay yep the just so happened that i happened to get a representative number of men and women a representative number of uh, um, African Americans, similar to the community that we're living in, right? So this is representative of Vail County, of Texas, of the U.S., whatever uh, your kind of numbers match up to, right? So you can talk about how representative is on those characteristics, right? And there may be other characteristics that are more important to you that they're representative of, depending on what you're looking at, right? If you're doing a survey of, of physicians, okay, you may want to look at, okay, well, what percentage of people are in different specialty groups, Okay, and how representative that is that of all physicians? Okay, so if you use probability sampling, you're more likely to get the uh, a representative sample just due to the uh, chaos, right? Randomness, that's how it works. When it shakes out, it falls into the same pattern you see of the bigger pattern. But it can also happen sometimes without trying so hard. With convenient sampling, you may end up with a representative sample. And if you're not, you just say that, hey, you know what? No, everybody in my sample um, was uh, was first generation and uh, first generation U.S. citizen and not uh, not a native U.S. speaker. Uh, sorry, not a native English speaker. Okay, well then, that's uh, then the applicability of my findings will be limited to people who have that background. And again, that's not the end of my study. It just limits the external validity, external validity limits the generalizability to some degree, limits, limits it to people that are like this, people that are similar to my sample. Okay, so again, the more diverse your sample, the wider field you can generalize to. The less diverse, okay, the less generalizability. Not the worst thing in the world. The other thing to think about in terms of how important is it that your sample is representative so is it that big a deal that i use convenient sampling is what kind of question are you asking are you asking okay can something have an effect or are you asking does something have an effect right? which are two different questions right you've got this new therapy approach and you want to know hey can this make people uh less depressed if you have a convenient sample and you make those people less depressed then yes it can make them people less depressed does it make people less depressed if used in the community i don't know I use it with these people, and they may not be like everybody. It's a different question. Can it work? Can there be an effect? Can there be a relationship? When that's my question, which is often an initial question, convenient sampling is good. Now, once I know something can happen, I want to know, okay, well, but real world, will it happen? Will it, how broad will this effect be? Does it happen with everybody? Now I need to have that representative sample, that larger sample possibly. Another type of non-probability sampling is quota sampling, sort of like the convenience version of strata, uh, stratified sampling. This is convenient sampling within strata. So maybe 
um, again, you're worried, wow, I really want roughly equal number of men and women because I want to look at gender differences. Well, if that's the case, then you set up a quota. I'm going to keep recruiting until I get uh, 50 men and 50 women. Once I get 50 men, I'm going to stop recruiting men. People that are men that want to be a study, no, nope, sorry, I got mine. I don't need you anymore. And I'm going to keep recruiting until I get 50 women. Right? And again, that's usually if you are interested in differences uh, uh, within those strata. Uh, snowball sampling is another kind of unique uh, method that's often used in um, qualitative research. And that's weird. And it's basically tell a friend sampling, right? Once you get somebody to be in your study, you tell them, okay, uh, who else do you know that's like you that has this characteristic experience? Uh, tell them about the study. Right. And so this is something that's really used for small or hard to find populations, right? If you want to do research on, okay, what's the experience of being um, transgender in the military? Not a large group and not an easy group to find uh, for, for obvious reasons. So somebody doing that research might use snowball sampling where if they have some connections to some one person, they may think, okay, well, if you are a member of this community, and there's often a community ar around that, then you may know other people. Can you tell whoever you know about the study? And then they'll tell you who they know, and they'll tell who they know. And again, if they tell, it's kind of like uh, multi-level marketing. Tell two friends. They tell two friends. You can now reach a, a larger group, which is great, again, for finding those people that are difficult to find. Obviously, some drawbacks, because now there's a greater possibility that you're going to have some sample bias because the people in your study will have some things in common. They may be in the same friend group. Right. So now when you're asking about, um, you know, some uh, some measure of uh, anxiety or depression or whatever, they may look different because, okay, maybe something happened to all of them in their little community of friends that makes them look different than other people who have that same characteristic but aren't connected to them socially. Right. So pluses and minuses for, for snowball sampling. In terms of recruiting a sample, um, using incentives uh, can be <clears throat> can be effective. In terms of uh, typically it's things like, oh, you, you can be entered into a drawing. And again, depending on what you're um, asking people, they'll be more or less invested in the questionnaire. And so you may have to have better or worse prizes. You always want to be mindful not to have too good a prize, right? Because it's an ethical issue in terms of over-incentivizing um, research, especially if the research involves discomfort to the participants. Um, one thing that, uh, based on social psych um, research on persuasion that we know works, is that uh, um, kind of a foot in the door uh, technique where you give people the incentive, a small incentive, before they've completed it. Hey, um, you mail them a survey, attach a dollar, attach a coupon to get a free coffee somewhere. Hey, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Well, I haven't taken the time to do that. I already have the dollar. I don't have to do it. But again, if it's a large incentive, then I think, oh, you're trying to buy me. That's not going to work. I'm taking the money and I'm not doing the survey. Ha ha. But if it's a small incentive, then there's this kind of cognitive dissonance that builds up where, okay, yeah, I already have the money. Um... It's not a lot, but yeah, go ahead and do it. It's not, not a big deal. And it is effective. It does increase response rates. Um, depending on how you're going to recruit, you may need to seek permission to recruit uh, different sites, right? Uh, in what uh, IRB you're under will typically specify uh, the degree to which this is true. In terms of first contact with participants, common ways to, to do that uh, would be with a flyer just posting information about, hey here's a study and obviously we advance the technology it makes it easier to do some things like you can put a, a QR code on there that links to your survey where they can take their you know smartphone hold it up bloop, and they'll take them right to the survey like that on their phone um, or you can leave a phone number or a web address or an email uh, if you get access to distribution lists you might be able to email potential participants or post on uh, social media and have people kind of in a snowball type of way spread a link to a survey uh, doing it in person uh, which is really uncomfortable for introverts uh, i'll tell you go up here and say hey would you mind filling out a brief survey you know walking through you know, like a library or a grocery store or at the dmv when people are bored and have nothing to do might be a good place to get a sample um, but one of the biggest sources of, of uh, sample recruitment are captive audiences in particular students right so a heck of a lot of behavioral science research is based on college students who 
uh, to get credit in a course or to meet department requirements have to participate in some research. Which again is great in terms of generating a source of data, but has some limitations in terms of generalizability, right? If all our if the bulk of our knowledge of the psychology of the human mind is based on people enrolled in college classes, in particular psych classes, that may be a skewed view of the human mind. Right? Okay, uh, circling back to something we touched on earlier, how big a sample do you need? Right? And again, in terms of representativeness, there's a point of diminishing returns. The other thing to consider about, consider in terms of how big is power, your power to find a statistically significant effect, difference, relationship, and so how big a sample size you need to have sufficient power depends. Depends on how big an effect, how big a relationship you're looking for. Like if, if I think, okay, I think this thing causes a difference, but it's a small difference. Okay, if you're looking for a small difference, I'm going to need a bigger sample than if, uh, wow, whenever people you know take this drug, they are going to go zero to 60, super fast. They're going to be talking like crazy. If I have this big difference I'm looking for, I don't need as big a sample. So small differences, small relationships, bigger samples, big differences, big strong relationships, I can get away with a smaller sample. Um, the other thing is how much variability is there uh, in the population? How much do you expect? How different are people on the thing you're measuring? If there's lots of variability, lots of noise in the data, people are different in lots of ways, okay, I'm gonna need a bigger sample. But if people are pretty similar, yeah, most people are, you know, within plus or minus two points in this measure, okay then if I can move somebody three points over, wow, I'm gonna see that because everybody's usually clumped up together. Uh, and there are uh, sophisticated power analyses you can do to determine exactly how big a sample size you need to have a certain amount of power. Um, but we don't have the space to touch on that uh, here. Last thing in terms of uh, sampling bias, it can uh, creep in a couple of ways. And again, sampling bias being sample isn't uh, reflective of the population and possibly in an important way. And this can come from your uh, recruiting message, right? So if you um, are looking to do a study of uh, uh, a smoking cessation program and you have these flyers that say, uh, are you finally ready to kick the habit? Have you decided it's time to make a change in your life? Sign up for this study smoking cessation program that will help you quit. Okay, that yeah, that's who I want, people who want to quit. Yeah, but if that's my message, who's going to come into my study? And more importantly, who's not going to come into my study? People who come in are those that, yeah, I am ready to quit. Let's do this, right? Think about the Prochanska Norcross uh, trans-theoretical model of change. People who are in that action stage, let's do this. They're going to be in my study. People who are in a pre-contemplative or in a contemplative stage of change, you know, I'm looking at the pluses and minuses. I kind of want to quit, but I still love smoking. Uh, no, I'm not going to be in the study. So you end up getting people in your study who um, want to quit. And that may mean that, okay, hey, look, my treatment worked. Maybe it worked, or maybe this is just people who are ready to quit, and so they did quit. The other thing to think about is uh, where you're recruiting from. And this has to do with like, uh, if you look to recruit on social media, right? And you're trying to recruit uh, maybe young adults and you have your message going out on Facebook. You may be getting a different kind of young adult than if you were using, you know, Instagram or Twitter, right? Whereas if you're looking for like uh, grandmothers, maybe Facebook is now the place to go. Like things change, right? Or if uh, I'm looking to recruit people to be in a study looking at uh, attitudes uh, about sexuality among singles, and I have flyers all over um, bars all over downtown. Okay, well, I will get singles that are going to bars, but they may be different than the singles who are going elsewhere to meet people in terms of their uh, sexual attitudes, their um, how I feel about whatever it, whatever it is I'm measuring. So the, there may be something different about the people in my study because of the way I'm bringing them in, recruiting message, or where I'm trying to get them from that recruiting pool. Okay, summing up, in terms of survey construction, it impacts construct validity, right? So how you're designing the questions, what questions you ask, how you word those questions will impact the degree to which you measure what you intend to measure, which is super important. But sample recruitment and composition of a sample also impact 
external validity, most obviously, in terms of generalizability. Who can I generalize these findings to? That's going to be influenced by how you got people and who you ended up getting. And it can potentially impact internal validity. Internal validity being the truth of cause and effect statements you make. Again, if you think about that one with the smoke station. Hey, this treatment really works. I made people quit. Well, if you recruited people who were ready to quit, it may not be that your study, your your uh, intervention made them quit. It may just be that they were at that stage in life. There's this other variable that your your sample got contaminated, had some bias that influenced internal validity. Okay, that's all for now. Take care.